Okay, but so was, it, was that you in your casual wear, Tibor? Yeah, I didn't expect people to pay attention to me <laughs> Why am I actually there. Like, it's not my uh, seminar, so is it recorded anyway? So, oh, you're recording, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I guess we can, uh, we can start. So, hello, everybody. Um, so, welcome to this uh, research seminar uh, on the current challenges in adolescent care held up by um, the Department of Family Medicine. So um, I am Maud mazanielo Chizol. I'm a doctoral student uh, here in the Department of Family Medicine, and uh, I work on uh, adolescent transition to adult care, and I will be moderating this um, webinar today. So we are very lucky to have two uh, great presentations. Uh, the first uh, will be on the competence uh, of family physicians in adolescent medicine, a mixed um, studies systematic review. Uh, presented by uh, Dr. Pierre-Paul Tellier. Um, so I have a very short uh, bio uh, from, by uh, Dr. Uh, Tellier. Um, so he works at the CLSC Côte des Neiges um, and uh, during his um, not so short career, uh, he has worked in every facet of uh, what a physician is expected to do. His current research interests are uh, quite varied and include human uh, papillona virus, identity development of family physicians, um, continuing professional development needs of family physicians in ad um, adolescent health and the competency in adolescent health that residents need to acquire, among others. And um, he really enjoys working in teams. The second one will be on, um, second presentation will be on the challenges of integrating the built environment in the context of clinical care, their circuit uh, experience, um, presented by um, Tracy Barnett, Barnett, Dr. Tracy Barnett. Um, so for her, again, short bio com compared to uh, all their uh, great achievement. Um, so uh, Dr. Barnett is an associate professor and uh, FRQS senior career award scholar. Uh, she obtained her doctorate in epidemiology at McGill University and completed a um, postdoctoral fellowship in health promotion in the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine at Université de Montréal. And um, the overarching aim of Dr. Barnett's program of research focuses on investigating the influence um, of features of built and social environments on cardiometabolic health and how these can be leveraged to improve health outcomes and healthy behaviors. He's executive director of the Health Services and Knowledge Translation Access of the Quebec Cardiometabolic Diabetes and Obesity Network and a founding and executive member of CIRCUIT, a lifestyle modification program for children and adolescents at risk of cardiovascular disease at St. Justine. So the presentation will be um, around 30 minutes and uh, we'll have a 25 minutes for the discussion. So you will be able to ask your question uh, at the very end. So please put them down um, and uh, you can write them on the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, please make sure that your uh, microphone is off during the presentation so we don't have uh, echo or back background noise. noise. And um, last, uh, the seminar is being recorded as you may have seen already. So if you don't want to be in the recording, please um, uh, turn your, your um, video off. So um, if there's no question before we start, um, please. Dr. Tellier, um, the floor is yours. And going to be there in a minute. There we are. So what you're going to see today or hear about is an example of what a family physician who is essentially a clinician can end up doing in research. Um, basically, with the help of people who are researching and doing some research as um, their career. So for me, Chero has been a very big help um, in the department and has ushered me throughout a lot of what I've done. And also with the assistance of many students who have worked with me 
and assisted me on um, doing and teaching me as we go through a project. So it's been a really interesting and it continues to be very interesting. So today what I wanna do is to think, talk a little bit, let me bring this back here. The competence of family physician in adolescent medicine, a mixed studies systematic re literature review. And how this started was primarily because um, the people from adolescent medicine at the children's wanted to include more um, uh, topics and adolescent health in the curriculum for residents. And that didn't quite work out. So then it was asked whether or not, or what family physicians needed to know in adolescent health. And there's usually things that are written in curriculum. So we decided to do a systematic review to look at it and to sort of then give them a little bit more information. So um, the people who worked on the team were um, Diana Ramos, who was then a student who helped me a lot with this uh, review. Oh, I made a mistake. Suzanne McDonald and Julius Ernstines are both pediatricians who work within the adolescent medicine clinic. And they're the people who wanted to know this information. Uh, Charo, who sort of guide us through the process, and myself. So why talk about adolescent health within family medicine? Well, there's over 7 million youth uh, between the age groups of 15 to 29. And here we're using um, the, param the parameters for adolescents and young adults, um, essentially uh, young adults being right after people finish adolescence, which is somewhere around 18 years age of age. Um, and this is from Statistic Canada. And it, it represents about 20% of the population. So it's a good number of these people. And in fact, you can see the proportion of youth by age group in Canada at this point, again, from Statistics Canada. So it's evenly divided pretty well between the two sort of the three groupings which are 15 to 19, 20, 24, and 25, 20 to 29. Now, when you talk about adolescence, you often will also include uh, the younger portion. So nine to 14 is when young people go through puberty and they're not included in this statistic, but we will also, as family physician, frequently see that age group. So they are a distinct and vulnerable developmental period at, at a time where they're doing a lot of different things and trying to decide what they're going to do and everything that has to do with their lives. So as a result, it brings up a variety of issues that are related to their experimenting with what life is about. So they're experimenting with trying to find a partner, they catch an SDI, or they get pregnant by mistake, because it's always a mistake, or they, um, they try substances and then they get hooked on to or not. But there's some consequences to sometimes trying some things. So they get into a variety of issues and problems that we need to know about. Um, now they're largely preventable, meaning that if we, the ones I'd give you, for example, if we do proper education, proper teaching, uh, they wouldn't get into trouble. But the other things that they, the things that they get into are things like accident. They don't wear safety belts. They get into a car with somebody who's drank alcohol. They don't, they, they don't wear helmets. And so a lot of these things are preventable. So we can, again, as family physician, intervene and try to prevent these things. Um, so the access to prevent, pre to essentially age appropriate primary health care services from competent family phys physician is um, important essentially for this developmental stage. Um, in Canada, what's been happening is that as um, the governments sort of govern and decide on what kind of pregnancies are going to be done, they're controlling the number of pregnancies or people who go into uh, specialties. And the specialties that are usually associated with adolescent health are essentially pediatric psychiatry and sometimes internal medicine for the older age groups. Now, the pediat pediatrics, for example, have been limited, and more and more individuals, again, related to, able to, to be able to get jobs, end up in subspecialties. So there are very few or less and less uh, general pediatricians who are out there offering care to uh, a population and doing some counseling. And people will go, for example, to the adolescent medicine clinic at the children's, but they will see specialists in eating disorders or um, in obesity, for example, so that individuals are presenting there and seen there within uh, 
already having identified a problem. So there isn't much known about the readiness of family medicine in general, and that's has been looked at. Um, and so we need to get more information. We need to prepare people more better for this uh, age group. So th what we wanted to do was to sensitize the current knowledge about family physicians' readiness to deliver optimal care to the adolescent population and to help prepare family physicians to better respond to the health needs of increasing numbers of adolescents with complex, chronic complex problems, which is the transition issue that mode you're working with um, so that they can assist in that process. Um, so what is the current evidence about family physicians perceived readiness to provide primary medical care to adolescents? So we decided to do a systematic review um, and we used um, an approach which is by somebody that's really not very well known. So we thought that we would quote and that's somebody by the name of Pierre Pluie or is that Plié? I'm not quite sure, uh, but I don't know. You may encounter him sometimes at some point in your studies. And we started the search essentially of the literature in 2016 and retrieved most of the literature at that point between 1996 and 2016. There were some issues, personal issues with some people working on it. So the project was put on hold and we did another update uh, to find out and see what had been published um, in 2019 and a further update just very recently at the end of the year in 2020. Uh, so the primary uh, literature came from the usual sort of sources that one uh, looks at. We did use uh, the search terms that we use were general practitioner, clinical competence, adolescent medicine, and you'll see a few other terms. We did not consider the gray literature and the publications we looked at were English, French, and Spanish uh, because uh, a few of the other, two of the other people I worked with know a little Spanish, not much, just a little bit. Uh, and so they would help. This is the search strategy that you can see it's a little bit involved. Um, and if you have really good eyes, you can see what it is. But if, and if you really want it, I can send it to you. Uh, the selection criteria is that we were looking at adolescents and young adults defined, as we def I mentioned, defined between 10 to 25. It had to address competencies, abilities, or skills of family physicians in adolescent medicine. Exclusion criteria were that they did not demonstrate a clear relationship between family medicine physicians' preparedness and care of adolescents. Uh, they focus on adolescents themselves or families and their opinions towards family physician and articles on training programs, which we'll talk a little bit later on. So ENDS residency programs. Um, the screening was done by two members of the team. Uh, that was myself and Diana, and we went through everything. And then we uh, chose the articles that we felt were appropriate. Then uh, we developed a scoring system, uh, which we validated, uh, you, which we again used pre-approach. Uh, approach and we came up with a scoring system and uh, four of us then went through the article for data extraction and um, the battle separated into two teams of two. And then we got together as a committee and went through all of our findings uh, or as a group to uh, decide what was the relevant information that we wanted to keep. Uh, we then used the narrative synthesis to bring that information together. Um, essentially what we did is it's a procedure, if you want me to read it, for describing, comparing, combining heterogeneous qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods when statistical meta-analysis is not possible. Um, so it followed three stages, preliminary synthesis, exploration of relationships, and then assessing of robustness of synthesis. Um, and so what we did is uh, we identified originally in 2019, um, a total number of 3,724 articles. After we do the, the duplication, uh, it was 1,497. And then after screening by titles and abstract, it went down to 20, 1026. And then using the quorum, quorum file, you can see a uh, chart, you can see how we ended up with 20, 49 articles that we did uh, data extraction on. Um, so that that's what we looked at. There were um, three articles that we, we, we got from looking at um, the um, 
reference list at the end of the studies that provide us with some extra information that were added to that 49. Now to this is not added what I've subsequently found with the last uh, review uh, or looking at the literature, the one that I did this year, and there's 10 more articles that will need to be looked at for data extraction. Uh, the thematic analysis provides us with three main themes. One is related to communication issues between the patient and the, and the physician, and ends talking to adolescents and the skills that you need in, in talking to adolescents. The knowledge gaps, and then those things that are related to a healthcare system, of which, again, transition is a very important aspect, and issues around access of care. If we look at this in a more detailed diagram, you can see, for example, the specific topics that come in. So uh, there's a lot around um, gynecology because that's a really hot topic at this point. And uh, for example, the in insertion of IUDs and the use of long-term contraceptives. So a lot of the literature was coming back on that. Um, eating disorder, um, ethics, uh, is an important aspect in relationship primarily with adolescents and respecting as we see confidentiality. Uh, and the confidentiality in fact could be brought into here at the intersection of all three circles because it applies to every aspects of healthcare related to the adolescents. And then in um, communicator, it's obviously re respecting confidentiality, explaining it to the adolescent, going ahead uh, with our history, touching, you know, sensitive issues such as substance abuse, uh, sexuality, uh, mental health issues, and then giving the appropriate counseling and the appropriate education. So this is part, the important parts of communication. Uh, the aspect of health care are related primarily to those aspects that are related to offering services, again, in a confidential manner where we can actually more or less guarantee to the adolescents that we will not divulge information that they don't want us to divulge to other individuals. And that is difficult in different environments. So in Quebec, we have um, the consent law for young people can consent for care at the age of 14. And they can also control the content of, content of their uh, charts. Whereas in other uh, areas, other provinces or other countries, it's 18 and sometimes even higher. So that people can be seen in clinic and then parents can request a chart and they can look at what's being set, written in the chart and then essentially then uh, go to their adolescents and say, well, you discussed about having sex. You didn't tell me about this uh, and sort of confront the adolescents. So see, these things have to be addressed and looked at point of view of the healthcare system and the law in general. Uh, and there's some places access to care is difficult. And so that also needs to be looked at and made aware. So point of view of our discussion uh, the, the really, what we essentially found was that family physicians are underprepared to care for adolescent patients and several areas for improvements were identified to improve the competency of family physician and adolescent medicine. So first of all, there are gaps that exist in the knowledge and skills, and we saw some of those in relation to the care of adolescents and, your, and young adults. Communication skills is very important around confidentiality and discussing sensitive issues, as I mentioned, and also around developing and communication, communicating with the adolescents as they go through developmental stages. So with a young adolescence, you're very concrete, whereas as you progress, you tend to become more um, abstract, but you also have to use a very common language as a physician. You can't be throwing words at them that, you know, like brevity or um, the epidemiology says, because they'll look at us blindly or as some instances have occurred to patients as described in the literature, the young person would just start crying because they don't know what we're talking about. And we need to also advocate in our position for changes and improvement in the healthcare system. Um, the review did provide us with a map for planning continued professional development for family physician. And it also opened up uh, and continued my desire to look at what can be done with um, 
um, within residency. And so at this point, what we've done is started a scoping review with uh, funding from the College of Family Physician to look at what needs to be covered within residency and should be covered within residency to provide the uh, pra young practicing physician with the skills they need. Um, the limitations are that um, the emerging adult term was not used originally in our search and we did not add it subsequently. Uh, and as you notice, if you extend your, your definition, as I mentioned at the beginning, to the age of 29, in the literature, they usually talk about adolescents going to age 18 on average. Many articles tend to deal with unique issues at a single site and so frequently are not generalizable. And it also reflects obviously the research interests that people have at this time. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of interest right now in long acting reversible contraceptive. So there's a lot of articles that are being published on this subject about IUDs, the risks of IUDs, using implants and things of this nature and the consequences that that might have on bone metabolism. So you get a lot of this. So you're missing some of the other important factors that are continued considered to be basic to adolescent health care. Uh, so that's it. That's all I have to prepare or present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Barnett. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I have worn firm shoes for the occasion. Let me see if this works. Oh, um, there we go. Perfect. Uh, and you may need to confirm if I have which, uh, which of the slides you can see. So it's the prevalence of overweight. There you go. It's the first one. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So it's not the um, speaker. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, very uh, happy to speak with everybody today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the circuit program, but first uh, a couple of a little bit of information about prevalence of overweight and obesity. Um, so we know that the, the prevalence in Canada has tripled over the past three decades. It affects more than one in four children. And you may know as well that if you're, um, if you're an adolescent with obesity, you're more likely to enter adulthood, of course, with obesity and to have it remain a lifelong challenge. And um, children and adolescents with obesity are especially vulnerable to cardiovascular disease and other complications. And, you know, there are concerns about life expectancy as well, the, the lowering. Now, I have to mention the pandemic. It's not surprising, of course, that we've been seeing even with recent uh, literature, um, deteriorating movement behaviors, that is physical activity, more sedentary behavior, sleep not as affected. Uh, but more concerning is that there are increasing disparities and uh, likely this will exacerbate uh, weight and obesity issues as well. So of course, uh, prevention would be preferable, but we do need treatment given the, the current landscape and given the prevalence. So we know that multidisciplinary intervention can be effective. Uh, and those that are effective include the physical activity components, nutrition should be supported and developed with sound behavior theory, but it still remains extremely challenging as I'm sure uh, many clinicians would uh, confirm. Um, so, uh, one moment, I'm going to see if I can um, get a pointer. One moment. Okay. Um, so some of you may know that most of my program of research fits into this diagram somehow, you know, whether it's assessing exposures or, you know, testing uh, mechanisms or, or, or pathways that sort of link the environment to uh, obesity or its consequences. Um, but one of the uh, clinical programs that I was involved with since its inception is the circuit program, and that's what I'll focus on a little bit more today. So Circuit was the brainchild of Dr. Marie Lambert, and I was fortunate to be part of that founding and executive committee. This was approximately a de decade ago, a bit more. So essentially the mission really was to provide a personalized intervention focused very much on physical activity at first that uh, leveraged those resources in our environment, whether it was at home, at school, or in the neighborhood. 
Um, so Circuit was a two year, at, at it, originally it was a two year intervention with eight in-person visits. It included very detailed assessments at baseline after a year and after two years. Now it's a relatively low intensity intervention when it comes to the, the clinical part of it, even though it is longer than most. So I do have to mention the amazing team. I don't want to make it look like I'm the, uh, the, the person who's running all of this. The, there's two co-directors, Dr. Henderson and Dr. Bigra, a great uh, multidisciplinary team with kinesiologists, nutritionists, psychoeducators, and a pretty large uh, research team as well with a lot of expertise. So you can see this is really a, a multidisciplinary uh, endeavor here. So again, the mission is really to have this personalized intervention, but also it's first and foremost a clinical program, but the idea was also to have a, a nicely structured clinical database for research. Also to test and evaluate maybe some innovative approaches and uh, do some, some community outre uh, outreach as well. So uh, my role originally was to help provide some information about the environment and the children's use of the environment so that clinicians could incorporate this into their into the action plan with the families and with the children. So uh, with Jan Kestens at University of Montreal and, and other researchers, uh, there really was a, an excellent uh, app and a strategy that was devised to, uh, you know, to, to do a diagnosis, a very detailed diagnosis of the environment that, you know, incorporated state-of-the-art GPS, accelerometers, heart rate monitors. Um, maybe you can already guess that perhaps this ended up being a little burdensome. Over time, this was somewhat streamlined. Um, the... It, the, the devices themselves took took different uh, forms, but we simplified the wearables for to use more streamlined or discrete uh, devices, uh, because of course the first focus had to be on clinical care, and the evaluation ended up being too burdensome, too time consuming for the clinicians, um, for well for the staff and for the families. Um, but still, there were lots of things we learned this way, and that the um, staff were able to incorporate into their discussions with. Um, with the families. I'm just giving a few examples here of the devices that were used and some of the uh, some of the outputs that were used to sort of track how physically active they were, for example. So over time, there's other elements that were incorporated, a nutrition program with, uh, you know, group interventions, workshops, and some fun family challenges. Um, uh, there is a psychoeducator that was added to the team to discuss, among other things, self-esteem and body image issues, of course, touch on anxiety and depression and, and other uh, mental health issues, and provide some tools for parents. There are also special events approximately once a month. They would try to uh, coordinate with existing or upcoming activities and sometimes uh, plan something specifically for the families and even a summer camp um, that came most years with a couple of different age groups. Uh, and this was provided uh, free of charge or very, very low charge, uh, low cost for, for all of the families. And there uh, remains a website right now that's still available that uh, describes lots of interventions for children and youth, information for families and for uh, professionals. So uh, what do the participants uh, look like? Um, just to give an idea here on average, approximately 12 years old, but you can see that their BMI Z score, I mean, you know, the mean would be zero, right? So you, we have here uh, 3.2, which is quite high, of course, what this is what we would expect. So out of uh, 100 children, you know, 91 would be uh, obese, seven with overweight and uh, other cardiovascular disease issues with the, um, the two remaining ones. And not surprisingly, prevalence of comorbidities certainly quite a bit higher than in the general population, showing here diabetes, dyslipidemia, or uh, elevated uh, blood pressure. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about the kind of research we can do with this kind of, of infrastructure. So first, we've talked about innovation. Uh, yes, we tried various ways of doing, uh, of evaluating mobility, movements, physical activity, both uh, also incorporating it into the treatment. And, uh, and so, you know, we did do a kind of proof of concept paper to try to uh, describe what we were doing and 
a kind of lessons learned as well and trying with recommendations moving forward on how to how to do this maybe in a little less burdensome manner. Uh, that was early on. Um, there's many kinesiology uh, trainees and, and researchers that focus more specifically on aspects of fitness. So there's uh, a lot of studies going on with this, but you might be more interested in learning about the effectiveness of the program. So we do have um, a paper that has been revised and resubmitted, but I'll just um, show you some of those uh, results here. So. There's many ways of looking at the effectiveness, but if we look in particular at the impact on the body mass index, and with children, of course, you have to use sex and age uh, specific uh, growth curves to, to compare, right, and to follow children over time, because you do expect weight to increase uh, normally. So what we found um, at baseline, the average, and these, this is just among the first hundred families that completed the two-year program, we don't have all of the data uh, ready for analysis yet. So it started at 3.3 and after two years was 2.94. So this is certainly, it's modest. Uh, it is, it is clinically meaningful. Um, and we don't have, you know, one of the challenges is we don't have a control group, right? So there's no way of knowing perhaps these children would have increased their BMI or would not have decreased, but it's certainly comparable to um, other programs. And uh, though I'm not going to show them all here, there were certainly improvements in other indicators and in blood pressure, lipid profiles, fitness indicators. So overall encouraging. Um, some of the other research that came out of the program, I, I mentioned that there were some uh, special events. There were, for example, 24 hour uh, screen challenges, you know, no screens for, for one day. So one of the trainees, uh, Sandra Pelez, uh, looked at the, this in a little more depth as part of her postdoctoral work. There lots of lesson lear uh, lessons learned there as well. So one of the biggest challenges in this type of program is attrition, right? The uh, uh, dropout or abandon is very common in these programs, reportedly as high as 90% and definitely higher in our older uh, participants compared to the younger ones, so in the adolescents. So it was no exception with Circuit, about 50% abandoned the program. So we did a study to try and identify uh, what were those uh, factors that might predict um, dropout or attrition. So that's something, again, that's lessons learned and trying to improve as, uh, as we move forward. And the, I think the bottom line for, uh, for that study was, of course, the older children were more likely to drop out. It was greater among disadvantaged families and lots of um, um, findings that suggested the improved tailoring that needs to be done. So uh, looking ahead, what's uh, great is that uh, Circuit is now being implemented in uh, other locations. Uh, the uh, co-directors funded, uh, secured funding to do an implementation evaluation in, in two other sites. One of them is another smaller city and one is quite uh, remote. Uh, so that's very encouraging, definitely streamlining. It's become now a one-year intervention, maybe only group um, uh, intervention rather than one-on-one, -on -one, but that's the reality. You know, we don't have enough resources. And uh, the sustainability of the program, this is actually very good news. When the pandemic hit, the program had to shut down. It was unclear how long it would shut down for. Um, but after nine months, the hospital did integrate Circuit into its normal operating budget. So it's now a clinic uh, like any other clinic and children can be referred to it like they would be referred to any other program. There is a waiting list and it is for the moment limited to those children with comorbidities, but the hope is that it can be uh, offered to all children uh, who need it. And um, these, these new um, this reinvention of circuit is also focusing a lot more on greater patient engagement, on, uh, on uh, improving access, lots of telemedicine and sort of, uh, you know, we've certainly learned that we can do some remote interventions now and uh, greater intensity in terms of more frequent contact, not necessarily face-to-face. Uh, -face. And if I have time, I thought I would just show you a very brief uh, video that the team put together, which... Um, uh, technically went viral, I think, on uh, according to my my scale anyway, and hopefully it'll work here. Uh, 
Let's see here. Mm -hmm. I think you have to um, change the pointers to the to the pointer to the normal. Uh, ah, I see. Okay, thank you. Pointer options are just automatic. That's correct. Okay. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tellier and uh, Dr. Barnett, for uh, this uh, great presentation, giving us uh, an overview of uh, the current challenges in uh, adolescent health. Um, so we'll open uh, now. It's the Q&A uh, session. So uh, please, um, you can uh, add your uh, questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, so if I, if I can uh, see, I have a couple of questions. So um, I'll start and please uh, feel free to, um, to jump in uh, whenever you, you want. So um, again, thank you for, uh, for your uh, great presentations. Um, so I have a um, quick question for the, uh, the circuit because it, it seems to be on a, based on an interdisciplinary uh, care model. And I was wondering if um, this model was quite different from the model that all already exists in uh, pediatrics which is quite different from uh, the adult care setting, which is more uh, still a bit fragmented. Um, and if in any ways you were planning to um, not measure that, but um, uh, evaluate um, the impact of the collaboration between professionals. Um, yeah, that would be something, you know, the, what we, um, one of the big lessons is that uh, because the clinical component, the clinical part of it is so much more um, the raison d'être, you know, like it has to be the priority, the evaluation part of it ends up suffering. And I would say, no, let, you know, the, the, uh, the ability of the team to work together collaboratively, uh, I, there's not been a formal evaluation. It, uh, it's something that was being uh, improved and worked on. I, I mean, I believe it's been going on for about eight years and every year there were improvements being done based on the more, you know, the previous year, lessons learned, discussions together. But I wouldn't say that this was a formal process or a formal uh, model of care. You know, it started with one particular focus, added other focuses, you know, like I said, physical activity, then intervention. And, you know, it may have been a, a, a faster process in terms of uh, improving it over time if we'd done that. And now it's been streamlined into something quite a bit simpler. So the, uh, the multi, it's still, it remains multidisciplinary, but it's really delivered uh, primarily, maybe 90% of it by kinesiologists. So the others are there in a support role, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say that we've done that formally, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Um, another question, if, uh, oh, Alexandra, please <laughs> go ahead. 
Thanks. Well, first, thank you both for these great presentations. It was really amazing. And it's really fun to see first the challenge of taking care of adolescents in primary care, and then going more specifically in this increasing problem that is also very challenging to, to deal with. And I was wondering, and it made me thought, I, I find uh, adolescents are often very sensitive to stigma. And, and, and obesity is one aspect that it's gonna be difficult to go to the clinic to follow up on, on obesity because of the stigma, and, but they do suffer from it in the population. So Pierre Paul, I can't remember in the big circles, I remember confidentiality, did stigma stick out in the, uh, in, in the essential parts of uh, caring for them? No, but that comes out, again, it's coming out more in the work that we're doing right now and stigma is more related to bullying and more related to those aspects because that is what's being studied. Uh, but also, um, I'm sure those of you who are clinicians, I've heard of the HEADS approach uh, of getting a history. And that's been changed because the HEADS approach is very much of an approach where we look for problems. We try to identify issues that are problematic. Whereas the other approach, and I forget the acronym, actually is a much more positive approach that emphasizes um, resilience, that emphasizes the positive aspects. So for example, the first question would be when the adolescent walks into your, your room is, well, what's happening to you that's good at this point? So that you're trying to find out and engage the adolescents in a much more positive manner. So some of that is coming out at this point and some of that literature is coming is um, occurring and it's more around, as I mentioned, the communication aspects and the bullying aspects and the issues are related to bullying. Yeah, I might add that in circuit, although I've shown you some results based on weight status and I talked about uh, you know, the proportion with obesity in the program itself, it very rarely comes up. There's, you know, it's very much focused on cardiometabolic cardi metabolic health, which is resonates more or less, but certainly on lifestyle behaviors and on fun activities and on, uh, you know, how you can interact with your environment in, in a more positive way. But they're very aware, of course, that these uh, these children do do suffer from, um, you know, from from stigmatized from feeling stigmatized from being stigmatized. There's biases around them, and um, it's it's a you know it's a concern, and it's something that the uh, the psychologists, the psychoeducators do discuss in in groups with with the families. But in some cases, it's the parents that want to enroll their children, and the children don't necessarily want to be there. So that's uh, you know, those, those families obviously don't stay. That's, you know, it's not, this is not a program if you're not motivated to stay, of course. I, oh, there is um, um, a question. So uh, was there any measurement of body image dissatisfaction? And uh, this was a big issue in some work I was involved in. Um, so it's uh, Anne Cockcroft <laughs> in, uh, with uh, pre-adolescents in Mexico. Yes, I so this was, in, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Anne. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to say I typed it in because, yeah. Yeah, thanks, yeah. go ahead. Yes, definitely. It's something that was measured. Um, that was so. There is a, a questionnaire that that is um, included in the evaluation. Um, we try to focus a lot more on the so psychosocial aspects. This is something that we track, and we sort of. Uh, I think a lot of the focus is on the gap between how they perceive their their body shape, for example, and what their desired body shape is, and hopefully that that um, the desired body shape would be within a you know normal healthy range. Um, but it is it is part of the the assessment, yeah. And not surprisingly, it's you know often um, quite negative this body the, this self image. So there's a lot of focus on on um, you know where where you can get your worth a little bit like the the ad, the, the, the little ad I showed at the end, uh, they've done a couple of uh, wonderful uh, capsules like that, as they call it. Is you have a question. Thanks. Thanks. 
Yes, Jill, please. <laughs> Hi, Pierre, Tracy, great to hear this work. Um, of course, right now, what's dominating the news is racism and equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. And following up on Anne's question, I'm just wondering um, how much of, uh, is there anything in your work that is taking into account some of the things we do that could be culturally biased? There's obviously very different body image um, perceptions based on cultural background. And uh, there, you know, that then is of course going to um, be complexified by coming immigrating or not being in your cultural group. So I'm just wondering what in both of your works you're doing to account for um, some of our measures that are definitely culturally biased. Yeah. Well, I can say that in our case, you know, I talked about the attrition paper and one of the uh, predictors of dropping out of the program was being a uh, visible minority or being non-Caucasian. This wasn't, uh, you know, statistically significant. No matter, there was still a, uh, a trend there and that certainly alerted us to the fact that it was... Um, when I talked about there's a need to personalize it more and to adapt it more, uh, I think because there were fewer, there were fewer non-Caucasian non uh, participants in the, those early years when we were developing it, there's clearly a need to, to adapt it. And that's why moving forward, I talk about more engagement, more involvement, more um, collaborative and, and uh, outreach with certain community groups. So it's in the works. And I would say that, you know, other than having indications that well, we, uh, we needed to do this, uh, in a little more systematic way, there's uh, an, an acknowledgement that that's very likely an issue. We don't have anything firm yet. The um, most of the literature that comes out at this point around uh, stigmatization and around issues pertaining to minorities are related obviously to what occurs more in the States than what we do here. Um, there are a lot more literature coming, or there, all their articles and all their publications and most of their works often are, if they're qualitative, include a race question, which is not systematically done necessarily in some of the work that's done in other country. And so they can analyze some of that implication of that aspects. We also see that a lot in the GLBT research and work that's being done again with young people because the impact on of uh, intersectionality on mental health in um, many of these individuals is really quite marked and so more and more people are looking at that um, I just uh, I was supervising a student who was doing her PhD not on adolescence but on older individuals with suicide in uh, people who are transitioning. And the factor that comes out is that in the US two years ago, because I don't have the statistics for last year, they had the largest number of um, homicides of young black trans individuals. So there is a lot of trauma that's involved in many of these things. And certainly it is very discussed, very much discussed. And I was just attending an adolescent medicine meeting two weeks ago in live environments, in presentations, uh, looking at, again, making sure that minorities are included, that minorities are respected uh, and interactions are, and they're starting to talk about interactions between the clinician and the patient and how those things will also affect the interaction, which is something that I have pointed out for quite a while now in a lecture that I give on sexually, sexual history taking with residents, that those kinds of boundary barriers occur and they affect the quality of the information that we can get from our patients when we're dealing with our patients. So I used to say, if somebody comes in at McGill when I was working at Student Health and they're coming in to see me, what they see when they walk in 
and they're coming in to talk about something that's sensitive is an old man who they assume to be very conservative because not only is he old, but he works at McGill and he's white and he is assumed to be waspish. And the adolescent may not feel comfortable or the young person may not just feel comfortable bringing issues out that are um, sensitive unless I open the door and it becomes then my role to be cut, to do that. So there needs to be a lot more research around that, which I think is very important around various aspects of the work that we do. That's really encouraging, Pierre, really interesting um, from both of you. Let's just hope that a couple of the states that are trying to make it illegal to provide transgender care do not succeed. Well, there's a lot of advocacy being done <laughs> and a lot of, there's a position, they're talking about writing a position paper actually uh, on behalf of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine specifically uh, about that issue. And we, I chair the committee, the GLBT committee for that organization. And last year we wrote a paper that was uh, released to the media um, when some of the states started talking about that. So yes, there's a lot of advocacy that's being done, but um, you know, just recently um, at McGill, um, just because I was implicated in this, because this is somebody that I work with, there's a gynecologist who works at Harvard who's doing uh, uterine transplantations. Mm -hmm. And these transplantations were meant to occur in people who had hysterectomy, who had, who wanted to have children. And so they would reimplant a uterus. And the article that was published asks, mentioned that they asked whether or not this could be done in a transgendered individual. The amount of negative uh, personal attacks that this person has received in the last two days has been incredible. Uh, and not only personally, but also on an academic level. There are people who are in some way threatening his position at McGill. So it's totally fascinating and, and interesting and unfortunate, shall I say. One step forward, two steps back. We'll get there though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another question from um, Marion, please. Thank you. Um, so, Thank you very much, Pierre and Tracy, for these very interesting presentations. Um, Tracy, I'm curious um, if the people that you were working with in the Circuit project at Saint Justine, if um, the next sort of phase of the rollout will involve family physicians and community clinics more. Um, I know. I've spoken to you about a, a kid that I tried to refer to Circuit and the wait time was really long. And we see so many kids now in um, our practices with obesity. And it seems from the findings of your study that the low tech kind of interventions are maybe um, just as effective as the high tech stuff. And I'm just wondering if there's sort of some plan to learn from that and move towards rolling out the the process into, um, I don't know, CLSCs or family medicine groups or something like that? Yeah, thanks for the question, Marion. So uh, on one of the uh, last slides, when I was talking about moving forward, I said that there was some funding secured for this rollout, for this implementation evaluation. And the idea is to develop a, uh, a guide at the same time. And those two sites, I think one of them is a CLSC, it's a community clinic. And I mean, it is seen as primary care. I realized this was delivered at St. Justin, but these are, uh, these are physicians that really do primary care. Uh, you know, potentially some of the children do have comorbidities, but in general, they're really trying to prevent the those consequences of obesity. And uh, so absolutely, the the long term plan is that this would be uh, rolled out. Uh, actually, the government is interested that there would be circuit plus sites available to every child and everywhere in the province. But, you know, it's going to be um, 
uh, a few years before we can say that. And, and this is going to be the, the implementation now is going to be the real focus of this, of this next stage and the, the evaluation. Yeah. And, and realistically, I mean, you know, it was a very resource heavy uh, intervention at the beginning. I don't know if I said that it, it was founded by, uh, are funded by uh, donations and, and uh, philanthropic organizations and the hospital foundation. So it wasn't not really sustainable in, in its original format. But um, what we have now seems a lot more, I mean, I didn't show all the details of it because we don't have time, but there is a quite a, a nice, well-developed plan for that, that streamlined circuit plus and uh, probably something you will see more of soon. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I may follow up on the on the on the tech uh, technology and attrition. I was just wondering if um, maybe you've seen since the pandemic a difference between um, the dropouts using teleconsultation or anything new allowed by the the situation. Well, that see that's the thing at this when the pandemic hit the program was stopped and it did not start again in its current form and it's just it's just not literally i think in the last month it was integrated into the hospital services and they are starting it they are going through the waiting list choosing the most you know serious cases to to start up again so i don't actually have that information yet i can tell you that they've gone from a huge you know clunky gps and a big accelerometer onto just now a fitbit and uh, they won't necessarily be tracking mobility. They might if the child uh, or the, the participant uh, has a phone, but the idea is to try to make this a lot less burdensome. So, and I do, that is my fear that perhaps this, you know, heavy evaluation might've uh, caused some of that uh, dropout. And so, you know, there were discussions about this, you know, you have the researchers who want the rigorous evaluation and then you want the clinicians who are like, well, yeah, but, we're, we're asking them too much and it's too complicated. And, you know, so it, it was good discussions. And uh, I don't know in, if in your practice, Dr. Tellier, if, you, if you've uh, moved um, to um, teleconsultation. Uh, yes, and it's an interesting experience um, and it will be interesting to look at once we take out uh, COVID portion of it as to what will remain. Personally, what I found is that it's facilitated me and it's allowed me to follow some of my more at risk patients closer because they're easier to reach and they are at home. So they don't have, we don't have to depend on them making the effort to come and see us. We can go out there and reach them. On the other hand, what it does is it creates a certain amount of complacency, complacency and um, those people who also don't want to see us, sometimes we need to see. And so it's a way for them to avoid us. And um, so I find that sometimes I'm missing things that come from just having the person sitting in the room with me and looking at the body language and the speech as well as the speech and what's being done. I'm not getting what I would like as much. And clearly there are things that I can't assess, um, which I need to assess and people can run away. So for example, if we look at young people, um, which we don't do PAPs anymore on young people until they're 21 or 25, depending on the guidelines that you follow. But if a young person doesn't want to come in for their PAP, that's an easy way to do it. You know, they call you on the phone to get their prescriptions or to get whatever because they don't have to see the doctor. Uh, so it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. But it is useful. And I find that I've enjoyed part of it and I've disliked the other parts. So it'd be interesting to see what we will be allowed to do by the government after this is finished because they somewhat control what we can do because if they say well you know you're not going to be paid for talking to people on the phone or by video um, we're going to stop 
and then we're gonna have people come back. Um, but some people it is helpful and it does provide an opportunity. So for example, in the project, I don't know how Tracy's project work, but in an issue like that, you want to do check-ins and it's an easy way of doing check-ins in a way that could, is somewhat even more personal than sending a text, for example, which a lot of programs similarly, which follow young people will do. I mean, if you can just, you know, contact them visually, it has a bigger impact, I think. That would have to be assessed, but that's my feeling. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, I don't know if you, if we have uh, another question and uh, we run out, out of time. So again, thank you for everyone's uh, participation. Thank you again for your presentation. I'm just um, um, announcing the next webinar on April the 23rd. Um, that will be on the imperative of engaging patients in research and quality improvement, developing know-how. And this will be presented by um, Dr. Nugus, uh, Peter Nugus, PBRN co-director, Jenny Haggerty, PBRN co-director, co um, Neboska um, Kovacina, QI director, Lucie Lambert, patient partner, Sonia Lucier, patient partner, and Najib Mokrawi, PBRN coordinator. So on April the 23rd, and again, thank you very much for your presentations, insight, and questions. I wish thank you all you. a good uh, afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.